Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Luis Valencia of the National Health ID Luis, Collaborative. Luis, Luis, yeah. just one moment. We're about to begin recording. So if we can start recording now. Go ahead, Luis. Thanks, Michelle. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Luis Valencia of the National Health IT Collaborative for the Underserved also known as the NHIT Collaborative. I'm delighted that you could join us for the Hepatitis in Communities of Color Strategies and Best Practices to Engage Consumers in Underserved Communities webinar, co-hosted with the HHS Office of Minority Health Resource Center, the Georgetown Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center, and the NHIT Collaborative. I also would like to acknowledge that this week is National Health IT Week. I want to encourage you to tweet about this webinar using the handle Hepatitis Awareness Initiative. Just a quick background about our organization. The National Health IT Collaborative is a private-public partnership that was launched in 2008 with the support of the Office of Minority Health at HHS, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, and over 100 organizations and individuals. We collaborate, with the, we collaborate with national, regional, and local organizations focused on addressing health disparities through the use of new technology. We work to amplify and foster partnerships across all facets of health and healthcare where there is a need for underserved populations, adoption, utilization, education, outreach, workforce development and training, and even policy development and implementation. We have demonstrated that when we bring together stakeholders across sectors to tackle challenges on the served community space, we can have a positive effect and change. It is now an honor to introduce Michelle Loosley. Michelle leads the Office of Minority Health Resource Center, and she works tirelessly to improve the health of racial and ethnic minority populations through the development of health policies and programs that will help eliminate health disparities. Michelle. Thank you, Luis. I too would li I'd like to offer welcoming remarks to everyone. We're glad that you could join us today to talk about hepatitis in our communities. It's so important that we discuss hepatitis when it, within all minority communities. And as you know, we've been having a series of webinars uh, to specifically talk on various topics. This month's topic is, of course, um, working within your communities itself. Our next webinar will be later in October discussing hepatitis within the Latino community. We are appreciative of all the speakers who are with us today and for their great experience in working with this disease in our communities. And I'll turn the time back over to Luis and our speakers to share their information with you today. Thank you, Michelle. Oh, next slide, please. We should be on the second slide. Uh, today we have a wide range of experts on our panel. We will be talking about how underserved communities are affected by hepatitis and their strategies, and their strategies and best practices to engage consumers in underserved communities. It is now my honor and a pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Claudia Monterell. Dr. Monterell is an infectious disease physician and clinical investigator researcher. She personally serves as the director and principal investigator of the Research Institute in Springfield, Massachusetts. Dr. Monterell, welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon to everyone and all the panelists. I'm going to do the initial overview, um, identifying barriers to engagement among people of color in this hepatitis C, in this hepatitis webinar. And then after me, the next panelist will be doing some presentations addressing um, how to overcome barriers, um, Project ECHO. There will be some information on best practices to engage consumers of color. And then some further recommendations to build current trends and successes in hepatitis um, evaluation and management, um, followed by an open discussion and um, a basic final conclusions. So with that in mind, the next slide, I will start 
giving uh, all of you an overview of hepatitis and what are the main barriers um, in terms of engagement among people of color. And the initial slide, um, I, I do not see the slide on the, on the monitor, but the slide, the next slide, please. Next slide. In terms of hepatitis and barriers, um, I am an infectious disease and I do treat um, all infections, but what I treat the most is HIV, hepatitis B, and comorbid conditions related to these infections. And I have been a clinical investigator in many of the medicines that are um, available right now for both HIV and hepatitis B in particular, and some of the hepatitis B medications as well. And one of the important things is to understand that people in the United States, about 3.2 million, although it's really more than that, 5 to 7 million people are infected with hepatitis C, for example. And the reason why it's higher than the 3.2 million that it's reported is because many of the patients that um, should, you know, are underrepresented and minorities are not being taken into account in terms of determining the real you know, incidence or prevalence of hepatitis C. And part of that is because the underserved populations, for example, Hispanics and uh, Blacks or African Americans, there are gaps in care um, from access uh, to care itself, insurance barriers, um, uh, problems with access to treatment, and then problems with the healthcare system, education um, barriers, uh, provider bias, um, and, and many others which I will go over with. And I think that one of the important things to remember about hepatitis C is that it is a curable, it is a curable disease. So when people get rid of it, when they get cured, there is reduction of liver morbidity and overall mortality. The next slide goes into barriers. And I think this is an important slide because you have the health system barriers the social economic factor barriers, therapy-related barriers, condition-related factors, and then patient-related factors. And I think one of the important ones is lack of access to diagnosis and to treatment. In many cases, due to lack of insurance coverage, people that are uninsured, but also insurance is not necessarily approving current uh, medications uh, for treatment of hepatitis C. Um, and one that I would like to mention is mistrust of the healthcare professionals. A lot of the minority populations, because of different historic um, experiences, there is a mistrust in the healthcare system, in the government, in providers, in pharmaceuticals, that does have an impact in access to care and adequate um, treatment. In terms of hepatitis, not everyone has symptoms of hepatitis. So that may be a reason why patients may not think that they should get treated. And one of the things that is important to always uh, mention is that it is a curable disease and that it may cause liver and non-liver uh, morbidity and mortality. In terms of other patient-related factors, substance abuse disorder, which is very common in minority populations, lack of belief in treatment, um, patients' perception or fear of adverse events, People still think that the main treatment include interferon, where now medications do not include interferon. It's a, a oral-based regimens with fewer side effects, higher cure rates, um, and less length of treatment. So education is a big um, issue. Fear of adverse events, people still perceive that the medications cause significant side effects, and that has changed. Um, and then some other things like unstable housing and homelessness in the Hispanic community, language barriers, and some of the cultural barriers like religion and the male to female um, interactions in terms of the culture itself. The next slide, I will just briefly mention that the black population with chronic hepatitis um, C, for example, the prevalence of hepatitis C is the highest in the black or African American population, and the black males have a higher risk of developing um, hepatocellular carcinoma. 
the next slide goes more into the Hispanic and Latino population, and it is always important to remember that Latino and Hispanic is a diverse group. Not everyone can be categorized into one particular group. You may have the Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, people from Central America, and depending on what part of the United States, the demographics in terms of incidence and prevalence may be different. Different. So, for example, more men than women are affected by hepatitis C, but if you see the Bronx, you may see a higher rate of women infected compared to women that are infected in Chicago. And if you look at the Bronx again, you will see that there is a higher rate of Puerto Ricans with hepatitis C in, in that region compared to people from South America in the Chicago region. And that is always important to realize because risks of infection and how people get infection and perceptions and education is different. So in terms of public health prevention and treatment, it is always important to know what subpopulation of the Hispanic community we may be or we may be having to work with. And Hispanics have the highest risk of hepatitis C related mortality. So this is a disease that can be treated and cured. Um, and a lot of our uh, minority populations are not um, being treated or evaluated for different reasons. The next slide goes into some of those reasons. In terms of gap of care, Hispanics, for example, historically low treatment completion rates for many reasons. There is higher mortality rates from hepatitis C related cirrhosis and the Hispanic ethnicity is an independent risk factor for hepatocellular cancer mortality. In terms of the African Americans, historically less likely to be screened for hepatitis C in the presence of risk factors, and then also historically less likely to be referred to a subspecialist for consideration of treatment. So I'm not even talking about treatment, I'm talking to be considered for treatment. And everyone who has a hepatitis C antibody test that has been confirmed by an antibody um, RNA or viral load detection should be referred for evaluation regardless of what is going on with, with the person, understanding that there may be some barriers that we may need um, to include a multidisciplinary team to then increase the probability that the person will successfully uh, be able to be evaluated and treated and cured. Um, the next slide, some other additional health factors that I think are important to mention because they are related to more rapid disease progression and they are more frequently seen in some of the minority populations include, for example, HIV co-infection. For example, my practice, 60% of patients have both HIV and hepatitis C because there is a lot of substance abuse, um, for example, heroin use. So addressing substance abuse is a very important component of addressing um, the hepatitis C epidemic. Also co-infection with hepatitis C. Alcohol use, in some of our populations, there is a cultural um, element of alcohol, in particular the Hispanic, where alcohol is um, promoted in a sense. Um, also obesity and diabetes is very commonly seen in Hispanics, insulin resistance, and fatty liver as well. So these are comorbidities that do need to be addressed in order to decrease progression and also be able to treat patients effectively. And then I have two more slides. The next slide will go in, into other gaps of care. And I think that our particular minority populations are disproportionately affected by people who do inject drugs and other types of drugs. Um, and historically, these patients um, are not really referred for antiviral therapy. And if they are, they are not always started or treated, and they don't always complete treatment, and in part this could be related to provider, provider bias or other preconceived notions. And, you know, patients may believe that they, they, you know, exaggerated worries about side effects or low perceived need for treatment. Incarceration also prevalence ranges from 9 to 41 percent depending on the data set. And again, there are things like unregulated tattoo use in the incarcerated setting. Not everyone will perform um, hepatitis C screening, and in not every um, setting people get treated. In some settings, people do get treated for hepatitis C because they will be there enough um, to be able to successfully complete, you know, the two or three months of treatment that is needed. But not every system has the, you know, the the access, and and people will not be there enough 
time to be successfully completed treated. And then individuals without stable housing, you know, these social barriers that do have an impact on access to care um, because it becomes priority for patients or clients and not necessarily hepatitis C will be their priority because they may not even feel that they have any symptoms. So that has also been shown that, you know, may lead to other uh, behavioral risk factors that then may increase even more the chances of developing hepatitis C or other infections. And then the next slide will be covered more by the other panelists, but I think it's important to remember that multidisciplinary teams are sometimes and in many situations needed with our particular populations. It has been shown that it does improve outcomes in terms of treatment, um, evaluation, and success. And, and even uh, potentially decreasing the chances of new infection or reinfection. So before I introduce the next panelist, you know, the last slide really goes into a quote from a former surgeon general where, you know, essentially drugs don't work in patients who do not take them. So if we are not able to improve access to the basic screening test or to have people even think about it and understand hepatitis C diagnosis and treatment, the fact that it can be cured, the fact that the treatments are easier to do um, and the side effects of the medications are minimal compared to what was available before, people will not even be um, able to get, um, you know, access to those curative treatments and potentially decrease a lot of the liver and non-related liver morbidity and mortality. So with that introduction, I would like to um, introduce the next panelist, who is Dr. Sherry Wallington from Georgetown University, and she will be addressing the strategies and options to overcome barriers, um, and she will be talking a little bit about the fact uh, she, thank you. Thank you, thank you so, so much, much Claudia. Claudia. Um, um, I, I want to uh, thank, thank everyone. everyone. There's, There's a little, little bit of echo, echo here. here. So, so I hope, I hope it's, it's not too disturbing. But, but I, wanted I wanted to just briefly talk, talk about some of the strategies that communities uh, can engage in as far as breaking down some of the barriers. Okay, okay first, we could categorize these into three overall categories. Uh, uh, next, next slide, slide please. please. Um, first, first, we have system-level system level barriers, barriers. and Claudia sort of captured, captured a lot of these, but I just think it's important to highlight some of these as well. As far as system-level system barriers, barriers, some of the focus should, should be that we should gain consensus about treatment and screening guidelines, address, address issues around limited infrastructure for providing assessment and treatment, treatment increase patient knowledge about hepatitis treatment, Increase, increase accessibility of testing locations, locations reduce long waiting lists for assessing care in some, some locations, reduce, reduce high cost of some treatments, and, and increase reimbursement to providers who care for hepatitis patients. Some of the, some of the practitioner level barriers relate to addressing practitioner perceptions about poor adherence, ongoing substance abuse, Relapse to substance use, as some physicians, as Claudia mentioned earlier, are unwilling to treat patients who are actively using drugs. Address suboptimal knowledge that some providers have regarding how to care and treat hepatitis patients and increase provider training. And then some patient level barriers that are well documented in the literature include increasing patient, patient knowledge, change, change in adequate, adequate perception about hepatitis care and treatment, treatment. And, and then address, address some of the other social determinants related to poverty, unemployment, stigma, incarceration, uninsured, and uninsured. Okay, okay. And, and so, so community engagement has to be a part um, of breaking down these barriers. So, so one of the things that's important to remember is, is to ask yourself who is, who is missing from this conversation about, about hepatitis, hepatitis care and treatment, treatment. Make, make a targeted a outreach, outreach plan to reach key stakeholders, and, and go where, where the people are. are. Uh, sometimes, sometimes we make assumptions on where 
we need to go to identify persons who need education treatment, but, but we have to identify and work, work within our stakeholders to identify what's missing from the from conversation. The and, and some of the benefits to community com engagement, you gain, you gain legitimacy and, and increase support for plans, plans projects. Project. And you, and you also, also give, give the community ownership of the, of the project, project and you are able to mobilize these resources. resources. And, and some, some strategies engaging the community is to seek, to seek out relationships with leaders from, from non-representative communities, work, work with them to identify, to identify the barriers to engagement and ways, and ways to bridge, bridge the divide, the divide into the community. community. On an, on an ongoing, ongoing basis, engage different, different types of organizations. For example, I know, I know Lewis uh, is going to be meeting and working work very closely with Project Echo, Echo with which you're about, about to own. And then and create, create many, many entry points, points for, for engagement, engagement and, and recognize the different, different levels of power and voice and impact and opportunity within the community. The community. When, when and if, if you can, can appoint patients, appoint members of the community to do advisory board, um, to work, work with you in planning and, 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 and invite you to be on task force, force so, so that our voices, voices can be a part, a part of the conversation. conversation. Okay. okay. And one, one way, way to do, to do that, that is include uh, members, members in the dissemination process. process. And, I and I want to highlight uh, some, some facts that, that we've been working on with Lewis and his team. And we're, and we're going to show first the African-American African fact sheet. Okay, okay, the next, next slide. slide. Um, the, the next sheet, uh, the fact sheet is for, for the Latino population. population. Okay. And the, and next, the next slide, slide is, for is for the African descent um, population. population. And, and myself, myself, along, along with, with our Georgetown, Georgetown colleagues, Chris Lombrado, Irene Gilson, Dr. Dr. Judy Wayne, and, and Dr. Dr. Corbo, we, we worked to develop these fact sheets. sheets. And some, some of the things we, we were interested in doing were to, were to make sure, sure that we, we May us sure that these were culturally, culturally linguistically, and health literacy appropriate, and we, and we used the literature to guide the scientific content and the messaging of these the facts. And, and although any form and tools that you can use for dissemination, such as media, social media, Facebook, websites, and, and again, again printed, printed material, material like device these fact, fact sheets, again, it's important to engage the community throughout the process so that, so that we make sure that, that messaging is appropriate. Is appropriate. And, and also that we're using the, the preferred channels of communication across, across different populations. populations. So, so I'll, I'll stop, stop there, there and, and now I'll, I'll turn, turn it over, over to our, our next speaker, speaker uh, that's going to discuss Project uh, uh, Echo with Dr. Dr. Kitten. My name is Marty Kitten. I'm a gastroenterologist at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And I would like to thank Luis and the organizers for giving us this opportunity uh, to spend a few minutes talking about Project ECHO. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Next slide. So Project ECHO was conceived and developed at the University of New Mexico by one of my partners, Dr. Sanjeev Aurora, in 2003 to provide hepatitis C treatment to patients in rural, medically underserved areas of New Mexico. At that time, uh, we had a specialty hepatitis C clinic at the University of New Mexico. Uh, no one else in the state was treating hepatitis C, and there was an 8 to 10 month wait for patients to be seen in our clinic. Project ECHO was an attempt by Dr. Aurora 
to figure out a way to get hepatitis C treatment to patients in these underserved areas. At that time, the treatment for hepatitis C was extremely difficult. It was interferon and ribavirin, which is akin to chemotherapy. Patients, even if they could get into clinic, uh, needed to come once a month for 12 to 18 months, and some of them would have to drive 300 miles uh, each way to be seen in our clinic. Could I have the next slide, please? There, uh, Project ECHO uses video conferencing technology to train and support healthcare providers who already live in underserved areas uh, in New Mexico and around the world so that those providers could care for patients with complex chronic diseases that otherwise would require special, sorry, just keep it on that other slide for a second, back one please. Uh, that otherwise would require specialty referral, which for these patients was not generally available. Even in the United States, where there are more specialists than any place else in the world, there's an extreme shortage or at least a disconnect between patients having access to that specialty care, and the situation is even worse throughout the rest of the world. Next slide, please. So the Project ECHO model uses four different uh, principles. We use technology to try to move the knowledge of how to treat these conditions to where the patients are, rather than trying to physically move the patients to where the knowledge is, such as a subspecialty hepatitis C clinic at the university. We share best practices for disease treatment with those providers in the rural underserved areas, so that using this model, we think we can get the same quality and level of care in rural underserved areas of New Mexico or Africa or Ireland uh, that we can get in Albuquerque or Boston or San Francisco or Chicago. We use case-based learning in our model like most uh, providers do in their medical school or in their residency, and then we monitor outcomes to see if we're really doing what we think we're doing. Using this model, we know that providers in these underserved areas are happier, they are more likely to stay in those areas because they have a net mentoring relationship with the experts, and they also develop uh, a networking relationship with each other. Next slide, please. So what happens in ECHO is that we have what we call hubs and spokes. Uh, back one, please. The uh, ECHO links specialist teams at the hub, and it's important um, in light of Dr. Martirell's comments that for hepatitis C, for example, we can put not only a hepatologist at the hub, but a mental health provider, a behavioral health provider, a nutritionist, actually anyone we think would be helpful to the spoke provider. Uh, the hubs and spokes participate in weekly online telehealth clinics called learning loops. This is not a one-time uh, seminar or uh, teaching opportunity, but these basically are weekly clinics so that the providers are supported in an ongoing fashion. The clinics combine case presentations, which may take up uh, an hour and 40 minutes of a two-hour session, and maybe a 15 to 20 minute didactic learning uh, session for the spokes. Next slide, please. So the, the spoke sees a patient at their clinic and they present the case via video to the expert. The patient is not present. Uh, the spoke and the hub discuss the case and the provider, please keep it back on the previous slide, please. The provider uh, will actually treat the patient. So a single provider may log into an echo clinic and present one case a week, but they'll have the opportunity to observe other spoke providers presenting 12 to 15 other cases that same week. This process will be repeated over and over until the provider becomes expert at treating that particular disease. Initially what happens is that the provider becomes comfortable treating their own patients for that condition. Uh, with a little more exposure, they may become comfortable being a local consultant within their own clinic, and ultimately we found that that provider becomes a mini-expert and a consultant in that geographic area. Next slide, please. Uh, in 2011, we published an article in the New England Journal of Medicine. We took 407 patients with hepatitis C previously untreated. Remember, these were in the days of interferon and ribavirin. Um, 146 of the patients, the controls, 
were treated at the hepatitis C specialty clinic at the University of New Mexico. The other 261 patients were treated at 21 echo sites around New Mexico. These were 15 federally qualified health centers uh, and six prison sites within the state. Next slide, please. And for this presentation, this is probably the most important slide. These are our results. In the second and third lines there, you can see that the uh, SVR, uh, that is basically a cure rate for hepatitis C, was identical whether the patients came to the hepatitis C subspecialty clinic or whether they were treated in the ECHO model. But the most important number here is that, that there was a statistically significant difference in minority patients in the ECHO group. This certainly was not surprising to us. But what it means is that at least in the days of interferon ribavirin treatment for hepatitis C and a number of other conditions, these patients weren't just going to get their hepatitis C treatment if they waited long enough. They were never going to be treated for hepatitis C under the current situation in those days. And this to us is the most important indication that using this model, we provide increased levels of care and increased availability of care to minorities and underserved populations. Remember, all of the patients in the ECHO model were poor and underserved, but a statistically significant difference in minority populations in that group. Next slide, please. So our conclusions at that time were that you could get comparable medical results, comparable safety. In fact, the safety was actually better in the echo-treated patients. Um, that was a little embarrassing initially for the subspecialty clinic, but our feelings are that patients do better if they can be treated at home with their own providers, surrounded by their family, without having to travel 300 miles each way to get their care. Uh, it, we also felt that this showed that you had increased access to treatment for this complex condition uh, for minority patients. Next slide, please. Since that study has been done, we've identified uh, factors that make a condition amenable to the ECHO model. We had 50 partners in the U.S. Uh, most of these are academic medical centers, although we also partner uh, with a number of government agencies like the CDC, the Department of Defense, and the VA. We have over 30 partners globally. These are mostly governments and national health services uh, in various countries around the world, and there are now more than 50 complex conditions uh, being treated. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, so now I would like to welcome Dr. Jeffrey Caballero uh, from the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kristen. Uh, I first want to thank the Office of Minority Health for sponsoring this uh, important webinar and inviting me to participate. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Jeff Caballero, and I am the Executive Director at the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organization. Uh, the topic that I was asked to talk about was recommendations to build on current trends and successes. And before I get started, I just feel like I need to add a little context um, before my my recommendations are, are presented. My, my experience in my area of expertise is primarily around um, hepatitis B, and that's really where I'd be coming from in terms of my presentation and my recommendations to you today. Uh, uh, just in case it does not come out um, as clearly uh, in the previous presenter's talk, I just wanted to note that liver cancer in particular uh, is the third leading cause of death in the United States, of which Asian Americans have the highest incidence of liver cancer, uh, and that the primary contributor to liver cancer is hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Uh, but in particular for hepatitis B, one in 20 in the U.S. have uh, hepatitis B. That is, 2 million Americans having chronic hepatitis B virus, 50% of which are 
Asian American or Pacific Islander descent. So to that point, next slide, please. Uh, I, wa uh, I wanted to be able to share with you a little bit about uh, the Hep B United. Uh, in 2012, with the help of the Office of Minority Health, APCHO and the Hepatitis B Foundation co-founded Hep B United. This is a national coalition of local coalitions. As you can see in the slides and where the dots are uh, at its founding, um, uh, Hep B United brought together uh, more than a dozen um, local coalitions at that time that were acting uh, to address hepatitis B challenges in Asian American and Pacific Islander communities uh, in their local area. Uh, since 2012, Hep B United has now grown to a, a coalition representing more than 30 plus local coalitions and national organizations that are that have aligned in this uh, in, in this effort. Uh, we've come together to support and leverage the successes of our local coalitions. Um, members of the coalitions include CBOs, medical students, physicians, state and local health departments, and many community health centers or FQAT. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, through Hep B United, we have been able to align uh, many national and local goals and efforts on behalf of underserved communities served. Uh, we've worked to, as noted in the slide, raise the profile of hepatitis B and liver cancer in the community, to increase hepatitis B testing and vaccination um, throughout our, our different community efforts and improve access to care and treatment for many individuals with hepatitis B. Uh, Hep, Hep B United in particular provides uh, webinars and trainings and shares best practices, provides many grants and mentorship to new coalitions around the country um, that are aligned with, with these specific goals. So, so next slide, please. With that in mind, um, uh, uh, some of the recommendations that I wanted to focus on, there are many, but these are some of the areas that we just wanted to focus on given our limitation in this presentation, um, is to continue to seek opportunities for federal and community collaborations to reduce disparities in hepatitis. Uh, Hep B United in particular has done this uh, uh, through the use of the uh, uh, the HHS National Action Plan to Eliminate Viral Hepatitis. Hep United has actually utilized the uh, HHS Action Plan and developed a, a strategic plan on behalf of um, all of our local coalitions that is directly aligned with the HHS Action Plan so that all of our local coalitions are working in concert with the HHS uh, Action Plan activities. Having said that, there are two particular areas that we are, are recommending greater attention and focus to um, in, in the years to come. And they are to improve collaboration that will improve surveillance data and completeness and quality of the information um, so that we can ba make better policy decisions regarding resources and communities to be targeted. And then secondly, one of the winnable battles that uh, that many of our local providers and groups are focusing on is to improving HPV screening practices of expectant moms and prompt administration of the birth dose. Uh, APTO ourselves, APTO has been working on um, our data warehouse to implement the Hep B patient registry <coughs> to strengthen our members' care and services related to hepatitis B and the needs in their community. But uh, the last area that I just wanted to be able to highlight in particular is that APTO has also partnered with the Hep B Foundation to collaborate uh, with Story Center on hepatitis B storytelling projects. Uh, the intention is to make real voices of everyday people living with hepatitis B or affected by hepatitis B, a key ingredient of our prevention and advocacy efforts. In particular, the plan is to provide training and support 
to create storytellers from our community, then to build on that capacity and support them uh, as spokespersons in their local community and nationally. Then this will help provide uh, us the type of leadership to challenge much of the stigma and, and efforts that are needed to promote hepatitis B screening and care at the local and at the national level. Next slide, please. One of the other important uh, strategies that Hepatitis B has been utilizing the last few years is working with our, our various national partners. Uh, this slide across the top lists for you some of the national organizations or partnerships that uh, Hep B United has been working with to coordinate our, not just our, 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 our policy and education efforts um, uh, uh, in the country, but uh, we've also made it a, a, a very intentional effort in terms of promoting partnerships between our local coalitions and the hepatitis B coordinators uh, at the local level, hepatitis coordinators at the state or local level. Um, we partnered with the uh, hepatitis coordinator association so that we can encourage and identify new opportunities for the coordinators and the coalitions to develop meaningful goals and objectives together. So this is an area that can continue to grow uh, as the communities um, that are trying to address viral hepatitis in the country uh, uh, are, are trying to establish themselves. Next slide. Uh, another critical um, um, uh, resource and recommendation particularly for Asian American Pacific Islanders given the diversity of cultures and languages that are uh, that are that, that exist among the high-risk populations for viral hepatitis is is a, is a centralized and 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 effective uh, communications effort uh, no hepatitis B is a very important um, campaign uh, built on a very strong model um, uh, it, it is recognized as the first multilingual um, viral hepatitis campaign um, sponsored uh, by the CDC. Um, through this campaign, we have CDC scientifically valid messages that have been developed in language in partnership with our communities and then distributed through our community partners. Um, it, it's been a very effective way of, of helping our community partners with much of their education and outreach efforts to ensure that the consistency of our messaging and, uh, and, and the effectiveness of these materials uh, are of highest quality to draw um, uh, many of the patients that are at risk and communities that are at risk uh, to actually seeing the, the, the messages as opposed to just another poster to walk by. Um, currently, um, the campaign is available in seven languages, and we're excited in that in this upcoming year, we're anticipating more languages being available. So uh, with that, um, the, my last slide, um, please. Uh, with that said, I just wanted to draw, uh, for more information, please go to our website at Be United uh, to get more information about the campaigns and the resources that are available. To that, that concludes my presentation, and I, I, I now turn it back to Dr. Claudia Mortorell um, to moderate the discussion. Hi, hi this is Luis. Uh, it seems like Claudia might have dropped off. If you have any questions uh, for our panelists, please put them in the chat box, and we will try to um, field them and have the um, panelists answer your question. Marty, if you could hear me, oh, can you elaborate uh, a little bit more about uh, 
not just the, the founding of Project ECHO and the amazing work that you have done in New Mexico, but what has been uh, some of the barriers uh, that Project ECHO and its partners have uh, faced when, in terms when it comes to engaging consumers in underserved communities? And, and what would be uh, some of the recommendations uh, that you have? There we go. Luis, can you hear me now? Um, yes, I can. Uh, and did everyone else hear the question? Yes, I heard the question. Great. Great. So, so the question was about some of the barriers in these underserved areas. And uh, we have numerous partners, and all of them have different funding and support models around the world. And so each one of them uh, deals with how the ECHO project, and particularly the time of the providers at the spokes, whether it's a family practitioner, a nurse practitioner, or a physician's assistant, uh, gets paid for that. And so in this country in particular, uh, with the type of healthcare system we have, we are constantly struggling with how we are going to get clinics and clinic providers to have the time to participate in ECHO when most of their clinics are on a production basis. We have numerous other partners around the world, like in Canada or Uruguay or Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland or Vietnam and Namibia, where the national government looks at Project ECHO and decides that it's a worthwhile model and builds it into their healthcare system. There, there are a number of states in this country which have done the same thing. Missouri is a perfect, perfect example where they fund Project ECHO directly at the state level to provide health care to the people who live in Missouri. Um, and they have found this to be a very satisfying model. In many places, Medicaid uh, does in fact pay for Project ECHO, pay the providers. They don't pay anything to Project ECHO. Uh, to support that model, um, and there's currently a bill jointly sponsored by Senator Hatch um, and the Democratic Senator from Hawaii uh, called the ECHO Act to look at embedding ECHO into federal funding sources like Medicare and Medicaid. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Jeff, go going to you. Uh, you talked about a lot about uh, your efforts in terms of the partnerships that you have created to lead uh, the hepatitis initiative. Can you elaborate on, you know, wh what would be some of the federal uh, support that we would need in our community uh, to continue some of these efforts? And also, uh, what would be some of your recommendations in terms of getting stakeholders, uh, such as the ones that are um, participating um, today and listening today, but also uh, that have spoken today, uh, to work together, uh, not just uh, in silos, but across multicultural communities and working together to lead these efforts. And uh, lastly, uh, and I know this is a multi-tier question, but lastly, uh, what, how, how would you suggest we go about um, building uh, on, on these efforts uh, from a stakeholder perspective in multicultural and sharing information uh, with our communities and our uh, providers in our communities? Uh, Louise, I, I, obviously, if I can answer all your questions, um, uh, I'd solve the problem uh, that, that we all have nationally, but uh, I can at least just share with you some of our some of the leading thoughts currently with regard to uh, uh, answers or potential uh, potential answers to your question. Um, uh, as, as many folks may be aware uh, that are involved with this issue, there are very limited uh, national resources uh, that are available particularly federal resources that are available to help address um, hepatitis B in this country. Uh, to this end, um, 
sir. We, we, we at APCHO and HEPB United and HEPB Foundation has um, been trying to um, work with our federal partners to increase availability of national resources that would be focused to help address viral hepatitis, um, not just B, but C as well. Um, but uh, with with the existing resources that are, that have been nationally available, we have been uh, working closely with CDC to try to get um, better parity in, t in terms of uh, distribution of resources that are available for B um, uh, compared to um, other diseases that they might be working with in the division uh, relative to uh, uh, to be more relative to uh, the, the prevalence around the country. Um, uh, but, but aside from CDC, there are a number of other federal agencies that are trying to address hepatitis C and APCHO in particular because we're National Association of Federal Qualified Health Centers. We, we've been working some more with HRSA in trying to help focus the resources and the efforts in that area. But, but there are an interagency work group that is working to address the National Viral Hepatitis B Challenge in, in HHS. And if folks are not familiar with that, uh, you know, the, the, the interagency working group uh, has very specific goals and objectives that they can explore potential partnerships with. Now, at the local level, the first thing that I would really recommend is that I that I would ask them to work and to collaborate with some of HEPB United's local partners. Some of our local partners have been in existence for more than five or six years um, and, and have um, institutionalized uh, relationships with some local support. So if, if they as an organization or a provider is working in isolation, please get in connection with one of our local coalitions. You can. All their contact information is all listed on the HEPB United site so that they can connect with their respective local coalitions and, and, and get into some of the concerted efforts across the country. Um, uh, I, I hope that answers part of your question, Louis. Uh, is there another part that I might not have recalled? Or do you want to go on to the next question? I, I let's let's go on to the other question. Uh, and, and Martin, I'm going to ask you to answer this question. Uh, and this is this is uh, from a Native American perspective. Uh, do you uh, has Project Echo work uh, with the Native American community? Uh, and, and if so. Uh, what what has been some of the efforts or some of the findings uh, working with needs from American community? Uh, yes, so thank you for that question. So some of our um, most spectacular ECHO projects uh, ongoing now are um, related to Native American communities and we have a collaborative project that's done in conjunction with the CDC Project ECHO and a number of pueblos and tribes around the country called Good Health and Wellness in the Indian Country, and and this project links up uh, Native American groups who previously have not talked to each other much about this to brainstorm with each other and to share with each other uh, health policies and uh, things that are working in their individual communities to encourage better health, better eating, exercise, diabetes, hypertension. And this is a project that is run now. It has evolved to being run strictly by the Native American community and just facilitated uh, by ECHO and by the Center for Disease Control. Well, thank you for that uh, answer. Uh, quick question. This this comes. This question comes from the. Uh, from Georgetown Law Center. Uh, are any of you uh, working with legal partners to develop domestic policy recommendations related to their research? Uh, Sonia, who asked the question, is, is, uh, is working on hepatitis policy associated with the Neo O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown Law Center, and would be interested in exploring collaborative opportunities with the presenters. Uh, and Jeff, and that would be to Jeff and Martin. We lost both Sherry and yes. Claudia. Oh, I'm here. 
This is Sherry. Sherry, so go ahead. I'm sorry we're not seeing you on the list. Oh, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. yes. I, I thought signing out would help this echo, which it sounds like it did. So uh, Irene Gilson, myself, Chris Lafredo, and Brent Corber, who are also researchers here, Judy Wayne, we are looking also at the possibility of partnerships with the law school. So I'm glad to see that they signed on because we did notify them about this webinar today. And I think when I was listening to Jeff and then also Martin, um, some of the other national efforts that I've seen across other disease and infections, uh, infectious diseases uh, uh, related to soul, or one of my areas of interest is HPV. And when you ask the question about uh, how do we work outside our silos, and I'm not sure it exists, and Martin and Jeff can speak about this, but a national uh, hepatitis round table convening uh, Lewis like we did with the meeting we had locally in DC but make it more national and broader where we identify all of the advocacy groups, organizations, uh, research organizations and have representative from those advocacy groups as well as patients so that we can bring all of these voices together uh, bring all the stakeholders and also make sure that we help our policymakers with accurate factual uh, information. Because I know with some of the uh, legislative initiatives, what policymakers really say they want, they want uh, fact sheets. Um, yes, they like the websites, they like the social media, but at the end of the day, they want something that's simple, like infographics that gives them the facts, cost associated uh, with some of these initiatives, as well as you know statistics that they can easily understand. And I think sometimes if we can uh, uh, develop ways that we can deliver the information in ways that people prefer it better, that might help as well. Um, I, hello, Luis. This is Jeff Caliero, and I just wanted to just uh, jump in and say that, um, that to the letter of the, the National Viral Hepatitis uh, Roundtable, NVHR, does um, this uh, has been a critical partner of HEPB United. In fact, I was part of the steering committee for several years before uh, stepping down and, and, uh, and helping found HEPB United. Uh, and NBHR is a critical partner for us. And I, I feel that NBHR is a, 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 can be an important platform for many communities of color who have not been historically involved in uh, viral hepatitis. Uh, advocacy and education and campaign change um, uh, to be the, the, the medium to facilitate that um, ongoing communication. So nbhr.org um, is their website, and they do have staff in Washington, D.C., as well as the West Coast. And, and, and I believe that uh, Ryan, who's the director there, uh, would be very happy to facilitate further uh, communications with this group. Um, Jeff, we have a question for you. Uh, what are the local agencies that's helping to educate the Asian community about hepatitis C and B? Yeah, as many of you will see, if you take a look at the uh, our list of coalition members, there is the coalitions are are are, are different combinations of of uh, lead and and partner agencies at the local level. Uh, we've been able to cultivate a model that welcomes any type of organization that is interested in addressing hepatitis B in the Asian American Pacific Islander community when we had initially found it. But many of our partners now are starting to expand and be, go beyond uh, the Asian American Pacific Islander communities. And you'll see a, a, a better representation of who those are than me trying to describe the plethora of models that currently exist. I mean, all kinds of, they, they can either be led by CBOs, some are led by um, medical student associations, some are led by clinicians 
or FQHCs at their local area. Uh, it, it really has, it, it is very diverse in terms of where the leadership has cropped up and the kind of partners that they've been able to cultivate over the years. Again, some of these groups have existed for more than five years and so I've been developing partnerships for a very long time and would welcome um, new and invigorating new partners as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, uh, Jeff, for that. Uh, one of the questions is where can we find the fact sheets that were highlighted earlier? Um, those fact sheets will be on the NHIT Collaborative website. Uh, so it's nhitunderserved.org forward slash hepatitis.html. And we will upload those in the coming week once we get full uh, clearance to do so. Um, with that said, we're going to go ahead and conclude uh, today's webinar. Uh, once again, thank you for attending today's webinar focused on hepatitis in communities of color. A special thank you to our speakers, our co-host and partners, the Office of Minority Health Resource Center, the Georgetown Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center. This concludes today's webinar. Have a great afternoon. And thank you all for participating. Thank you.